We're talking about sales productivity and outbound prospecting on today's episode of This Week in Sales. Hello and welcome to This Week in Sales. I'm Kevin Gaither, the Director of Inside Sales at BetterWorks here in Santa Monica. You may recall the goal of the show is to help sales professionals with tips and tactics and techniques to help them improve their performance right now. Today's guest is Isaac Garcia, who's the co-founder and CEO of Central Desktop, which is a cloud-based collaboration platform company. Isaac, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. Good to see you again. Good to see you as well. Isaac, what's your nightmare sales job? Nightmare sales job. Uh, it would probably have to be the first job I ever took um, once I moved out to California. And it was um, an inside sales job at a software company. I'd never sold anything before in my life. Um, actually, I graduated with an English degree with zero marketable skills at all and somehow ended up to, um, taking a, up a favor of a friend. And I ended up working closely with the founder of the software company. Um, it was based here in California. And um, just kind of learned the really hard way of here's a phone, here's some software that sort of works, and you don't even have a lead list. You've got to figure out how you're going to outbound call. And uh, kind of really cut my teeth that way. I actually ended up learning a lot and actually being pretty good at it. But it was more uh, hard work and luck than anything. Right. Yeah. Well, trial by fire, right? Absolutely. I, I think a lot of us were raised on that. And by the way, I have a degree in architecture, as you know, of, right. of all things, right? <laughs> so good, good. Well, that's, uh, that's great, uh, Isaac. Before I introduce Isaac properly, let's have a word from our sponsor. How many times have you heard that the contract is signed on my desk and I just need to scan or fax it over? Asking your buyers to print, sign, scan, or fax back a contract creates the hassle of extra steps. EchoSign simplifies the problem by making contracts digital. EchoSign is extremely easy to use for senders and signers, owned by Adobe so it's a trusted source, and integrates with all major CRMs, Salesforce, NetSuite, and Sugar. Call 877-324-6744 and use the promo code ThisWeekInSales to take advantage of a special discount they have offered for our viewers only. So my guest today is Isaac Garcia. As co-founder and CEO of Central Desktop, Isaac oversees building strategy and sales for the company. Isaac has a proven record in both early stage technology companies and enterprise sales and marketing. As a founding partner of Upgrade Base, Isaac served as Vice President of Sales and Marketing where he oversaw all business development and sales for the company. During his three-year tenure at CNET, Isaac served as Director of North American Enterprise Sales for CNET Channel. As Director, he was responsible for the acquisition, sales, and management of global par partnerships with Microsoft, Google, eBay, Yahoo, and Best Buy. Isaac led and managed CNET's global partnership with Microsoft to launch the Windows Marketplace campaign in 14 countries, Microsoft's largest sales and marketing campaigns at the time. You've done it all, it seems like, <laughs> and you're doing it again at, uh, at Central Desktop, and I know we've talked about this in the past. At the beginning, you were doing it all. You were the CEO, but the VP of sales and everything all wrapped in one. H how did you manage all that? Well, a lot of it's, uh, it's the chaos of, of an entrepreneur when you first start out. You got to be able to figure out, you got to talk to the customers on a regular basis. So early on, we weren't really comfortable, and I wasn't comfortable outsourcing that out to someone else. So it was really important that I be on the front line, that I hear the voice of the customer, and that we kind of learn from that. And then we were translating all that into product and engineering. But yeah, early on, it was uh, literally. Uh, Anytime the phone rang, I was picking it up, and it was support, it was sales, it was um, engineering questions or whatever, and I kind of did do it all at that point with my, with my business partner. I remember the first sales rep that we hired was literally someone doing the same thing. I said, his name was John, I said, John, just come in, pick up the phone, and answer whatever they want, and by the way, you better be selling something too. So it's right. a little bit uh, uh, kind of translating the right. nightmare sales job to him as well. Yeah, right. Yeah. You know, we actually had a guest uh, on the show. Uh, the very first show that we had was Aaron Ross. Yeah. And we talked about his nightmare sales job. And his nightmare sales job at, I believe it was called Lease Exchange, 
um, was the fact that he did not do sales as the CEO of his company. He outsourced oh. it nearly immediately and hired a VP of sales and gave up that responsibility of learning how to sell. Mm -hmm. And he recognizes now, hindsight's 2020, yeah. recognizes now that that was you know, absolutely a, a mistake on his part because yeah. he didn't learn how to sell. He didn't know how all those processes, and it was like, uh, he, he abdicated as opposed to delegated, basically, right? I think there's also a credibility factor once you do start hiring people that if you don't know how to sell it or if you can't articulate the customer value point, then it's going to be difficult for someone else to be able to do it. Right, right. Uh, what did you learn through that, by the way? Well, uh, <laughs> I think what I learned was that it takes, uh, it takes probably several tries to get it right. So even though I was on the front line, once I started hiring a sales leader to come in and build or scale the organization, because I at that um, early on I had maybe four, five, six, seven reps at, at any given time, but then I said, okay, we we're, we need to scale this much larger. So I started bringing in other sales leaders, and it took us two or three times to find the right one. And frankly, it wasn't so much because of um, um, uh, their lack of skill necessarily. It was, we were trying to figure out how to sell and we're trying to soak all this knowledge out of my brain into something that was scalable. And it wasn't until we hired our most recent vice president of sales who's just awesome, who's been able to sort of extract that out of me and says, all right, I got it, I can run with this now. But probably a couple years before, um, I don't know if we would have been able to attract someone like him, mm -hmm. um, nor do I think um, our company might have been ready at that stage as well. Right, right. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. So we talked about things that were on your uh, on your mind when we were uh, you know prepping for uh, for today's show, mm -hmm. and one of the things you mentioned was sales productivity, sales productivity, sales productivity. Yeah. yeah. Tell me more about that. How, how do you think about that as the CEO? So I think with. Um, I mean, we're a venture-backed company, so we're always looking for what are the key indicators that, that are showing the future growth of the company. And sure, you might hit a number, whether it's a sales forecast or whether it's um, a sales goal that you had. But the real story of the company is what is the ramp and what is the productivity of that team in the tenure, as the tenure of that team is hired, and is it getting better? So sales productivity is what's driving um, a key metric in our company that tells us not only how we're doing, it's what did we learn, how we're doing, and where we're going. Because mm -hmm. if the trend is better, then we see opportunity for more scale. Sales productivity is probably one of the top three metrics that we look at for the entire company, okay. if not the first. Yeah. After sales bookings, of course. Th that's, yeah, right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Always. And of course, there's the difference between the bookings and the actual revenue too, Correct. right? Right. Absolutely. But, but let's let's get down to brass tacks for those playing the home game out there. Sure. You're not measuring sales productivity. Hey, what's sales productivity, right? You're measuring some specific metrics that are indicators of sales productivity. Right. Talk to me. What are some of those metrics? So we do a couple of things. I mean, obviously, the ultimate productivity ramp is their red, is their product is the revenue contribution over over time. But in order to get there, you want to be managing towards results which also means you have to be managing towards specific behaviors. So we started backing, um, backing out, like, I think like most companies figure out over time, and it takes time to figure it out, what are the behaviors that you want to manage towards that are going to drive the revenue. And in our case, it wasn't just making calls, well that's part of it. The key driver for us in our business was um, the amount of demos that we were making to customers. So we knew that we have a certain kill rate based on the number of demos that we would give, so we would drive all of our activity and all of our incentives towards the reps scheduling and executing against demos on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the leading indicator metric that we have on productivity. Mm -hmm. Even for the early hires, maybe uh, um, for a brand new hire, a brand new hire, we're going to measure whether or not they're going to succeed in three or four months based on the number of demos that they're setting up and those that are executed. Mm -hmm. And the whole organization is really um, organized around that particular metric. So um, I don't know if it's called sales productivity, but it would definitely be demo productivity that we measure early on. Sure. And, if, and if that hired rep isn't driving the right demos, even if they haven't contributed, even if they have contributed some revenue, mm -hmm. if they're not driving the right demos, they're probably not going to be successful in the long run. Right demos? Um, well, what I meant by is like maybe they might close a little bit of business and they say, hey, there's more coming around the corner, but their demo activity doesn't really back that up. Mm -hmm. We're going to look at the demo activity more than the rep saying, hey, I got a couple deals around the corner. Right. Question is, where is your demo activity? Got That's it. driving everything. Excellent. Yeah. So let me take a stab or a guess here. Mm -hmm. When you onboard a new sales rep at Central Desktop, mm -hmm. the message becomes, Here's the revenue contribution we expect out of you, mm -hmm. and the behavior that uh, that that 
we feel has had the highest probability of success in hitting this revenue contribution is this particular type of demo activity. Right. And again, correct me if I'm wrong, you also would are probably saying the calls matter, but if you're having a ton of quality demos, I could care less what the amount of calls are. That's right. It, it, yeah. A absolutely. I mean, of course we look at calls, we look at we track those very uh, very accurately, but you can call all day and you can be pounding the pavement, but if you're not producing the demos, the revenue isn't going to come. Yeah, that's exactly right. So let me challenge you for a second here, because I've been through a, an environment where demos became that leading indicator. Mm -hmm. And one of the ideas we had, and I wonder how what you think about this, why don't you just incent the customer, the prospect, to do a demo? We'll give you a $50 gift card if right. you do a demonstration with yeah. us. Why not do that? Yeah, we um, we haven't done that. Um, I think maybe um, there's a little bit of a principal issue that I've been part of. Uh, uh, I've been trying to been sent personally. People have been tried and sent me to look at their demos for 50 bucks or whatever. And you know, uh, I think the reality is, as CEO or as a target customer, you know, I'm really looking to solve a specific problem, and I don't need another 50 bucks to help me figure out whether um, or not you have a good solution or not. If you can't convince me without the dollars that you can potentially solve a problem you're probably not going to take you seriously, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that has a lot to do with it. I think there's a place for it, but um, in B2B business, I, I'm not sure that it really is. I think maybe it's more of a consumer um, a mindset where you're trying to incent someone to try something because you know there's going to be an ROI. It's, I think in complex sales, it's a little bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I was actually in a scenario at my previous company where the uh, one of the leaders said that same thing. That's the leading indicator. Perfect. Let's incent the the customer yeah. to do the demonstration. And I emphatically, you know, shot that down, saying it's just the wrong incentive yeah. because that what. I felt what was going to happen was that we were just going to drive demonstrations up and the outbound or the you know revenue that came yeah. from that was going to go down significantly because the intention was wrong it was misplaced yeah. there and instead if you took that $50 as that you know cost of acquisition or whatever and maybe put it into the um, rep incentive totally. you give know it to the rep right <laughs> exactly flip it that's one sales guy to another right yeah. let's let's get let's give it to the rep but i uh, i have a, a story here and again this is for the sales leaders playing the home game <laughs> you know you tell a sales rep to do one particular thing and they will do that and you have right. to be very very careful about what you're asking them to do. Um, I ran a contest, and this is this is my learning lesson that drove me to be so emphatically against driving to pay for the demonstrations. I told a sales rep, or I ran a contest in the month of January, whatever it was, mm -hmm. and I said, the sales rep that has the most demonstrations with a uh, with, with our potential customers gets a whatever it was, $100. I didn't even remember what, what the dollar amount it was, right? Well, there was the quality and the quantity, and I was focused on the quantity mm -hmm. without any other end result there. And the guy that won it had literally three times more demonstrations than he'd ever had and blew everybody else out of the water. And by the letter of the law, Isaac, I paid him out, yeah. but then I sat with him for a week watching him do what he did. Yeah. Guess what he was doing? Pitching office managers, pitch, pitching janitors, anybody. anybody who would get on the phone, he'd say, well, let me just show you what I've got. And then he would check that box in salesforce.com, yeah. did a demonstration, and his numbers were going through the roof there. Yeah. So it's a, it's a real fine balance, you know, especially if you say, okay, let's pay the sales rep to just do demonstrations. But what you're balancing is there's the demonstrations, but then the revenue Absolutely. that's got a result out of it. I mean, of that, on our right? board, um, if we're running a similar contest, on our board, it's not just the demos, we've got the revenue right next to it. Right. The, the only time that demos matter without revenue is when you first hire the rep. In the first 30 to 60 days, you know they're not going to contribute revenue, but they better have the right demo activity. Right. right? That's a leading indicator. Yeah. Well, what's a typical sales cycle, by the way, in the, in the corporate sales or the middle market for your company? Just so, um, we, we have two products that we um, sell over the phone. One is Central Desktop, the enterprise product. That's actually about a 45-day cycle. Yeah. Um, yep. the, um, uh, the other product, Social Bridge, um, it ranges anywhere from 45 to 100 days. So exactly. it, that one definitely goes longer, but it's also a higher price point. Exactly. And, that, and that's the reason why, of course, in the first 90 days that right. somebody started, you can't measure them on that that revenue there. Correct. So uh, sales productivity, real quick, what are some of those other metrics that you're tracking uh, or KPIs there? There's the revenue, yep. there's the demos that are done, what else? Any relative metrics? Um, yeah, like, um, I mean, we do, 
we also track, I mean, we, we, we back into, um, how, do, how do I put it? So the, the calls that we're asking our people to make to um, drive um, demos are usually around a smaller fixed set of leads, which we can talk about a little bit later. Um, it's not, you know, here's a phone book, go try to call. It's, it's a, a smaller set. So we track some of the activity and calls just to make sure that the reps are on the phone. But we're not counting the, um, you know, how many new prospects you're calling into because we're only giving them a fixed set. It's like you got to break into these accounts and try to win new business. So um, other productivity metrics that we look at: um, revenue, demos, calls. I'm trying to think of another one um, that that's uh, mattering as much. Uh, I guess something else specifically stands out. Good. Yeah. I, mean, I love th it. Those are the ones that are driving most of the activity. I love it. Yeah. Those dashboards that have 12 things no, on no, them. No. <laughs> no one's going to look at them, but no. they're pretty. Yeah. They're <laughs> real pretty, right? So okay, great. So you've got these metrics. You know what drives your business. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. How do you raise the productivity of your sales team and, and increase those numbers? So, I mean, that's, um, I guess that's the magic question, right? It's um, how do you, I think it's different for every company, for every business. For our business, what it took was, we're hiring a lot of um, younger, um, I want to say inexperienced, but definitely um, younger reps that maybe don't have as much B2B software experience. How I mean, young? We're in, how we're, young? We're in LA, so you know, you got to hire uh, people that are coming out of the entertainment industry a lot of times. But uh, um, how young? I mean, anywhere from right, a couple years out of college, um, I'd say most of our reps, um, we do have some that are over, but probably very few of them are over 30 years old. So they're okay. rel relatively young, they have some experience. Um, so for these guys, um, their productivity is a learning curve. And what they need to see is they need to be coached in how to do it. And in that coaching though is the credibility factor of either their immediate manager or in our case, the VP of sales, and in some case, me, but usually now it's the VP of sales that, his name is Lawrence. Lawrence will build credibility and coach these reps on a round table and they'll do the calls together, right? So that they see, wait a minute, this isn't the VP of sales or the CEO telling me to go make these calls. He'll show me how to make them and we'll do them together. And there's actually a, an inspiring component to it. So they'll little stutter and we'll coach them through that entire process, but that hands-on coaching, is, is, there's a direct aspect in productivity because they see that they're, they have someone in the trenches with them. Mm -hmm. and that matters so much. Um, so it's increasing productivity. I don't know if they, what the exact measurement is there, but if you didn't have that coach in the trench with you who was trying it, uh, it would have a significant impact. Because you're asking someone to figure it out by themselves. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's go back to your question. It was around productivity. Yeah, how do you raise um, it how do you ra up? Oh, the other yeah. was, um, so one was the, the in the trenches coaching um, real time. The other one is um, simply the, the competitive culture. Mm. Look, we're in sales. Um, I always tell the rest of the company, um, if you guys ever complain about sales, why don't we do this? Let's cut your salary in half, and you got to earn it back every quarter, a piece at a time, right? Um, and you know, that's usually that'll quiet the rest of the company if they realize that. So the culture of the sales team is that they know they have to fight and they have to drive in order to win that business, so that they can make their paychecks and, and, and more. So we set up a competitive culture in a positive way, whether it's team based or whether it's um, contest based and we'll do fun things so that it's it's fun but you also recognize who wins and who loses so that's there's a clear delineator huh. we're trying to drive more winners and sometimes you lose and sometimes the losers have to cook breakfast for the winners huh. so um, I think the first time we spoke a couple weeks ago about this show um, uh, the whole sales team yeah half the team was serving the other team breakfast and right. that was part of the contest right. we have another contest around who's driving the bus Right. Who's driving the bus? Is the customer driving the bus for you, or are you driving the customer? So we have it's primarily around demos, of course, right. um, that are that are showing that. So we literally have yellow buses up on the wall that are yeah. showing each team and each individual contributor. Yeah. Now you realize though that these kids that you're hiring, yeah. they've never lost in their entire life. <laughs> so is that a, do you ever find that a challenge? And that you point out the losers and they go. I'm no loser. I got a trophy hey. every time I played soccer. No, sales isn't for anyone. And um, working at our company, the sales department isn't for anyone. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to have hard conversations. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, though, they have talents that we move into other areas, whether it's customer support, experience, maybe they're better at product, whatever. So, hey, we're, we're fair, but hey, everyone isn't a winner. Um, just by the nature of any sort of stack rank, and we show stack ranks publicly on the wall of how people are performing, mm -hmm. it's clear who's winning and who's losing. Right. And we coach those guys, but at a certain point, you realize sales isn't for you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very it's good. Tough. A little tough love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no doubt. I mean, that's a, you know, we can have a whole episode on um, Gen Y, no, yeah. no doubt about it. <laughs> but I'd rather talk about your outbound prospecting, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, I know that several years back, you, yeah. you started your outbound prospecting teams. Mm -hmm. uh, 
What did you learn? Talk. Why did you start it? Give okay, me the yeah. t talk to me. <laughs> so when we started the company um, back in 05, the first three or four years, we were selling a very horizontal product, and we still sell our horizontal product. We call it our enterprise business. And essentially, as a collaboration platform company, our product appeals to many companies to do lots of things. You can manage projects, share files, documents, etc. So. In theory, any company could be using our product. Well, you can't outbound to everyone and just say, hey, go try to sell some central desktop. Go try to sell some collaboration to some company. It just doesn't work. But you did, though. But we did, but that was <laughs> primarily driven on an inbound business. Ah. So in the first four or five years of the company, it was all an inbound business. Marketing leads coming in, people were hunting us, saying, hey, I'm, I'm interested in your product, and we would filter through those. We had a, uh, we'll have a whole series, we could talk about that if you want, um, of inbound people that were um, filtering the leads, passing them to closers. Um, but that was all of an inbound business. Traditionally, for the first four or five years, it was all inbound. Today, majority of our business is coming from the outbound function, which is what we're talking about. So on the outbound function, um, we, wanted to, we wanted to hire um, a team that was going to outbound into the world. Where do you start? Who are you selling to? Why are they buying? How do you price it? How do you go after that market? So we experimented with many different things. Um, we tried selling central desktop into uh, marketing agencies. Let's say we tried this. We've learned over time about a year and a half ago, or more than 18 months ago. Um, but we were calling into a low end of, of the market, people that were uh, companies that were smaller than 50 employees. Really difficult to sell to those guys. They're very price sensitive. Um, companies less than 50 employees don't have a lot of free flow cash, so it's difficult to sell them a product, even if there is customer value. They're going to go for a cheap, 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 cheap thing. Um, so we said, well, we got to aim higher. So we aimed at marketing agencies at a higher level, and we built um, an entire um, um, program around this. The, pro the product that we sell in the marketing agencies today is called Social Bridge. That's the other product we sell. Mm -hmm. And Social Bridge is a collaboration platform for marketers, specifically um, advertising agencies. In order to sell, sell to these guys and to hire reps to outbound, we needed commitment at a, at a company-wide level. So it was a company goal to say, we want to go and outbound. We're not just going to hire a team to do it. The company is going to commit to it. So it was at, a, at the executive level, at the board level, at our investor level, we said the big goal is to pick one particular customer segment, build an outbound team around it, and execute against that, and have everyone support that effort. So the marketing team was involved in creating you know, collateral websites, microsites, creating lists, finding lists. Um, the sales team was developing the script, perfecting it against different folks. Um, the engineering team was doing product tweaks to serve that particular market. It was an entire company effort to drive Social Bridge. Did um, that, wait, hold on yeah, a second. Yeah. Did that happen all at once? No. So the reason why we did it that way is because it didn't work the first time. The yeah. first time, we, our salespeople we had hired someone, hey, just go try to sell to that one market. This was 18 months ago. Didn't work. They tried it. They didn't have the support of the rest of the company. I mean, everyone said they supported them. But you know, uh, I wasn't there. The board wasn't supporting them, saying, you know, is everyone around this goal of selling Social Bridge to these marketers? Um, instead, it was a sales guy trying to figure it out. And it just didn't work. They needed more support. They needed um, me as CEO to elevate their efforts even higher, to call out the efforts that everyone was making towards that particular event. So I'm getting sidetracked here. Um, so we, so in order to outbound, we had to pick a segment. So we chose the marketers, and there's a series of events. But it was that executive company-wide commitment that made that work more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, you can drive in more specific on that question if you want. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. I, I love. It, it, there's, um, I had Josie Ann Fagan on the show, who's an inside sales expert um, and and one of my favorite people out there in the in the sales leadership and training space. And she, you said. You can't just have that salesperson do it all by themselves. You know, you need to have that that company culture. But at the same time, she would recommend, and I want to hear what you say about this. Of course, that salesperson though has to be involved in that creating of that content. Absolutely, they're they're not, um, you know, blogging for example or uh, tweeting the right kind of content that supports that particular effort. You know, that salesperson is not relieved of creating content to support their own efforts just because there's a marketing person oh, no, no, involved no. here. No. And, and where do you draw the line with your no. salespeople? No, absolutely. Um, Lawrence Sotsky, our VP of sales, was the you know, top of the pyramid of driving this initiative by, by every means. Because he said, look, I'm not going to wait around for the business to come into me. You know, Isaac, if we're going to build outbound, I need to know who to call, where to go. And he absolutely led that. And he was part of building the collateral, 
the scripts, the voice, testing, everything that part of that. Without Lawrence driving that effort, because ultimately he's accountable to it for that number, it would not have been successful. So if it was just a committee working on this by itself, wouldn't have worked. It was led by Lawrence, supported by the entire company, with me using a hammer to tell everyone, go support Lawrence in the efforts of this outbound effort. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. I totally agree with um, what Josie Ann Josie Ann, yeah, I absolutely yes. agree with that. You ought to look her up, she's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, are the metrics any different on your outbound prospecting team? Yeah. Talk to me. So on the inbound basis, I mean, I, I'm oversimplifying it, but there's a lot of business coming in. So they're, they have a different skill set. The inbound guys are picking up the phone call, and they're more of a renaissance salesperson in that they're listening to the customer, because the customer could be from anywhere, oil and gas company, they could be a sales and marketing company, all, anything. And our reps are trying to translate that into, well, let me s figure out how Central Desktop can solve your problem. So it, it's a very different way that they're selling. The outbound guys are selling a specific use case to a specific marketer, to a specific person around a certain script. So they're delivering a very different message. So um, productivity, how do I put this? Um, the inbound guys are getting a, trim, um, a lot of inbound business, but closing the sale is more difficult because it's more complex. The outbound guys are closing a deal maybe um, um, it's more specific, so h how do I measure the productivity against those two? So, I mean, we do have them at different levels. I'm going to put it this way. Um, the inbound guys have a higher quota because there's business coming into them, mm -hmm. right? The outbound guys have a lower quota. So even though maybe their productivity levels are maybe equal or just a little bit different, it's different based on their quotas. So mm -hmm. that's one way. Um, yep. I can do try you to still be measure them based on demos? Do you allow them to do demos? So it's, yeah, okay, that's a good point. Um, the outbound guys or the social bridge um, sector of our business is entirely, we, we monitor demos closely. On the inbound business, we haven't as much because there's just so much coming in at any given point. It's a luxury we have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they right. have as well. Good for you. <laughs> right, right. But um, in order to raise their productivity, we are now managing that inbound business team to demos as well. Right. So, kind of full circle back to that. Gotcha. Yeah. Is a qualified lead in your space on the outbound prospecting team, somebody who's been through a qualified demo that has identified a particular pain point, has all the BANT you yeah. know, qualification uh, set, is that get past then or is there a qualification hurdle thereafter or is it is somebody else doing the demo? Um, so we have, so the reps aren't, the, the reps are part of the demo, but um, what we've figured out um, very specifically is um, to sell to to sell Social Bridge to the marketing agency, it's kind of a pretty big story. So we have a couple of sales engineers that actually drive those demos. It's not that they're over complex; it's that you want the um, demo to to really be perfect whenever you go out. And a rep is juggling so many different things and asking them to also be a master demonstrator. I think is a pretty tall order. Exactly. I mean, obviously some of them do do it, and they're involved in the and they're on the call with that engineer. But the sales engineer is a limited resource that we use to drive all those demos. Exactly. So yeah, I think exactly. uh, that is de definitely important. I mean, I'm a huge believer in segmenting the activities of what the rep is doing. If you're asking them to prospect, are they also closing and they also, you know, um, managing renewals and doing a demo? That's just too much. Right. You, you got to segment what they're doing. I, I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more yeah. uh, in that that demonstration, especially if it's a technical type of product, yeah. boy, you're going to put that onto the, what did you say, 24 year old, 25 year old, mm -hmm. you know, to get it right. And they're going to be asking questions about uh, security and right. using big acronyms and words that these right. people probably don't even know or can pronounce, not yeah. that they are not capable of doing it, but they are a um, hammer, not a full tool belt. Right. You know, They're very good at doing that outbound prospecting. So I'm really glad that you say that, and yeah. I think that's really important for our audience yeah. you know, to hear that. And you and I both know Aaron Ross, yeah. um, and he says the exact same thing, Absol yeah. absolutely. So I think that's fantastic. I mean, I'll, I'll drive it home a little bit more, it's simply that in many times, um, it's taken weeks or months to get that demo with maybe the CEO or the CIO or the CTO of that particular company, the creative director, whatever it is. And sometimes you only got one shot, and it better be the best shot you got. Right. You don't have a chance to kind of redo it again. Yep, exactly. Good, good. Yeah. Let's wrap up the show here and talk about the tip of the arrow, the tip of the spear. Mm. That's the hiring, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So you said, you know, the sales at Central Desktop, you know, it's not for, not for everybody. Oh, yeah. So let's flip that on its head. What is the ideal hire, or what does that you know prototypical hire look like for your outbound prospecting team, for example? Yeah. So the outbound prospector, 
I mean, there's a couple of things we look for. I mean, not that everyone is necessarily athletic, but if they have, uh, they have to have a competitive edge to them. If they're not competitive, and if they don't get a little bit irritated when they see you close that sale or when they hear you doing really well, if that doesn't kind of bother them a little bit, then they're going to be too lackadaisical. So in our interviewing process, um, we dig several times to try to find that out, right? Are they satisfied with their base salary? This isn't the place for you, right? Um, you got you to gotta want to be driving towards more. And then you kind of don't always know in the beginning. I mean, salespeople are really good interviewers. Uh, they're really good at, at, at selling you. Um, but they have to have, I think the, probably the most important thing for us is the competitive edge. But we only have one profile because there's, um, we absolutely recognize that some of the reps are better at closing, some are better at opening, some are better at relationship management, and you need all of them to run your business. So we don't profile against only one. Um, it depends on maybe they start off as a prospector, but we know ultimately they're going to be a relationship person or they're going to end up being more of a closer. Because right. some people are just more aggressive at closing and it's a little bit abrasive, but um, they don't know how to open up a deal. Right, yeah. right, exactly. Um, I don't know if you've read this book already, and I'll, I'll leave, leave uh, you and the audience with, uh, with this. Um, one of the best books that I, that I read about hiring salespeople was called Never Hire a Bad Salesperson Again by Dr. Chris Croner. Mm. The, book, the title is incredibly trite, all right? Mm. Um, but in it, he talks about drive. Yeah. Drive with three components, competitiveness, yeah need for achievement, yeah. and optimism. Yeah. And I've used that as a basis for my hiring with 80% uh, success rates. I'm using real metrics that I've tracked, by the way, on that. Mm. Um, and it's a, a wonderful, if you could say, look, I could take somebody who was at a hotel desk, but if they've got drive, yeah. they'll make really good salespeople. So, and yeah. I love how you start with the, you know, competitiveness, and it's not just you know, this role, this role, this role. It's like they all have to be very competitive to do well in our environment. So Our, our take on that would be calling it, um, are they able and willing, right? right? In, in the quadrant of able. If you're able but not willing, well, maybe you're an engineer, but you're not going to be a good salesperson. Excellent. Maybe you're really willing, but you just don't have the ability. That's going to kind of work against you. So we, we do strength testing against that. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Great. Well, that's all we have for, uh, for today. Isaac Garcia, thank you so yeah, much thanks, for Kevin. coming on the show. Yeah. Great if to be you, here. Thanks. If you have any additional questions for me, and I'm getting emails on a weekly basis with suggestions for the show, please use askkevin at thisweekin.com. And of course, like our Facebook page at This Week in Sales. Tweet at us at Sales Week. And of course, download our iTunes podcast. And finally, find us on YouTube, and that's youtube.com forward slash show forward slash This Week in Sales. Next week, we're going to have Mark Roberge on the show, the VP of sales of HubSpot, one of the fastest growing SaaS-based companies on the planet right now. And he'll talk to us about how to build an inside sales team from scratch the right way. Thanks for joining us today on This Week in Sales.